times from this pulpit when I was preaching here how much I appreciate the work of Hollis Maynard and now Bob Anderson who's joined him. I really, I guess I don't want it bad enough. I covet their ability. If I want it bad enough, I'd do what my wife is doing, and that is attend their classes and get to where I could do it. But then, you know, if I could do that, I could do everything. Anybody could do everything, wouldn't <laughs> What are y'all laughing about? But I really do honor and love and appreciate them for their work's sake and what they mean to my wife as well as to me. I'm grateful for them. And uh, I think it was Hollis was telling Bob that he got the easy ones and, and uh, Hollis got the hard ones. Well, I guess maybe Hollis is in for it again because this may be a hard one. I don't know. I do really love Job. He's one of my very best friends and has been for over 22 years now. He's gotten me out of more difficulties that my ignorance and my stupidity has gotten me in that I'd like to mention. And the reason is it was his ignorance and his stupidity that got him into his difficulty. And it really lets us know that ignorance is not omnipotent. You know, a lot of times I really believe that we are persuaded that our ignorance hinders God. It really doesn't. Our ignorance does not hinder God. Our unbelief does not hinder God. In the final analysis, nothing hinders God. And if I love God and I'm called according to his purpose, as Job was, then he'll work out my dung heap too. I mean, he'll, he'll work out my leprosy too. He'll work with me out on that ash heap just as surely as he worked with Job on his. And everybody has an ash heap. What's yours? I mean, everybody has one. Everybody has that leprosy. What's your leprosy? Everybody has that, that doubt that, that clings to their belief and wants to destroy their belief. And that was the problem with Job. He was not an unbeliever. He was a doubter. And there is a big difference between an unbeliever and a doubter. It's where your doubt sends you that determines if you're a believer or an unbeliever. If you're an unbeliever at heart, then your doubt sends you away from God. If you're a believer at heart, then your doubt sends you to God. And that's where Job's doubt sent him. He was a confused individual. He was at sea. The captain was dead, the first mate was drunk, and the rudder was gone, and there was nobody at the helm. I mean, he was in difficult circumstances, and we do not have the right to go back and accuse him in his unreasonable character until we've sat on the same ash he, he has with the lack of the revelation of the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus. See, Paul can rejoice in his afflictions. And James can say, count it pure joy, absolute joy, not even any bad stuff mixed in. Count it pure joy when you fall into manifold trials. Why? You know what Job never knew. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. I want to introduce tonight's study again by just putting up one chart that we had last night. And this will be our only review. I want us to know that Job, or remind ourselves of the fact that Job wanted to argue with God. I can understand why. He couldn't find any answer in his heart. He couldn't find any answer in Eliphaz's misinterpretation of Scripture. He couldn't find any hope in Bildad's review of past events. He could find absolutely no hope in Zophar's uh, intellectualism that says the answer is in what man has searched out and found out. And after he listens to Elihu, he can't find anything in modern revelation anyway, in what the young generation would have to say about his problem. And he doesn't find any answer from God. He says, I want to find God, but I can't. So if I just had an umpire, I know I'd die, but I'd still argue. And I, if I could find him, I'd argue with him. And I just wish he'd do two things for me, not hide his face from me and let me live long enough to talk and let him see that he's wrong. He doesn't believe any of that can occur, so he writes it down. He knows. I didn't bring the chart back up with it, here with me. But he knows he'll be vindicated. He has faith that God will come down one day and vindicate him, and somehow he'll see that, and somehow he'll be satisfied. He has a faith in that that isn't based on revelation. It is based on what he knows about God and what he knows about himself. So he believes that God will come. So he says, let's just write it down somewhere and I will sign my name and I'll let the Almighty answer me. 
Now, I don't want to do that. I've said that every time I've mentioned that because I want you to know that that's not my desire. My desire is not to argue with God. I want to be as quiet as I can at judgment. I mean, I don't want to be a speaker at judgment. All I want to do is say, whoo, isn't he great? And then I want Jesus to do the rest of the talking. And he will, won't he? He is our advocate. He is the one that will plead our case. But now Job doesn't know that. So Job has said, I really want to argue with God. And I wish you'd turn to chapter 38 of Job's book. And we're going to look at chapters 38 through 42 tonight. And we're going to see that God honors this honest man's request. That's what God normally does, isn't it? When, one, when an honest man wants something, God normally arranges for that thing to occur. Now, Job wanted an opportunity to present his cause before God. He wanted to debate God on the issue of Job's integrity. He thought it was unrighteous for God to judge him. And he thought he was being judged. He thought it was ungodly for God to bring this disease, this leprosy upon him. And so he finally, God's going to speak. Now, we never did get the time, and, and I'm sorry because he really deserves a good look. We never did get the time to look at Elihu, the angry young man. Uh, but Elihu doesn't say anything the other fellows hadn't said. You read chapters 30, what is, where's Elihu begin? 32, isn't it? You begin with chapter 32 and you go through chapter 37 and you'll read what Elihu has to say. He won't say anything that Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar hadn't already said. He'll dot some eyes a little stronger and underline some things and make some things bold that they haven't made, like that suffering has a disciplinary value and that suffering sometimes reveals the love of God. They said that. They didn't ignore that. In chapter 5, Eliphaz said, God is chastening you and happy is the man that the Lord corrects. And so Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar have said that too. But in chapter 37, Elihu starts talking about lightning and thunder and rain and, and, earth, and, a, and a great storm. It's brewing. I've, all, I've always pointed to my right hand. I don't know why. But over here on this side of the sky, the storm is brewing. I mean, the thunder is just boom, boom, boom. And the lightning, and you've got ropes coming down out of the clouds. There's no doubt that we're about to face one of the worst tornadoes that the East has ever seen. Elihu beats it over the hill, and Bill, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar in the cave. There's a painting that hangs in the Louvre in France. I've never seen it. I've seen prints of it. And underneath it, it simply says, Job and his friends. And you've got to look real close to see the friends. There is a fellow sitting in the middle of that painting, and, and, the, and the whole painting seems to center on him. And he's down on his knees, and his hands and his face are upturned. If you look real close, over here on the left-hand side of the picture, that may, that's right to you, but to me that's left. In the left-hand side of the picture, there is a skeleton of a man going over the horizon. I know who that is. That's Elihu. I had to search the print to find three shadows inside of a shadowy cave. And there's Bildad and Eliphaz and Zophar in their tornado shelter. And here's Job out here ready, willing, anxious for God to speak. And God speaks to him. Chapter 38, verse 1. Then Jehovah answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? How the mighty have fallen. Before I put this chart up here, I think I'll put a second one. I was going to show you later, but we'll just jump ahead of ourselves a little bit here. What was the Lord's, our whole study tonight is Job and his God. What was the Lord's concept of Job at the first? You remember? Chapter 1 and 2, no one on earth like him. He's my number one man. He's my main man. He's my 18. He's the best I've got. And if you can beat him, Satan, you've beaten me. Nobody like him. Perfect. That word means complete. Upright. That word means correct. Straight up and down. Fears God and turns away from evil. The positive side of his religious life, he feared God. The negative side, he turned away from evil. Therefore, he had a spark to life, didn't he? You ever try to run a battery with two positive poles or two negative poles? In either case, you're in trouble. The battery won't run the vehicle. But religion that is only positive 
won't work. A religion that's only negative definitely won't work. The positive one would work better to come closer to working than the negative one would. But Job is a perfect man. He's upright morally. He fears God and turns away from evil religiously. He holds fast his integrity under trial. When he's lost everything he possesses except his health and his wife and four servants and his land, in one day he still holds fast his integrity. And so God has witnessed about him at the beginning that he was a perfect and an upright man. When he first speaks to Job, what is his concept of Job? That, he's a dar that he darkens counsel and he speaks without knowledge. Now somebody, well he's right sometimes, a clock that doesn't run is right twice every day. And anybody that says as much as Job is bound to be right some of the time. What Job says right about God, many Buddhists and Hindus and other folk say about their God. And they are correct that God deals that way. They're incorrect in what they call him. They look at nature. They look at the love a mother has for a child. They look, at, they look at God's care for the animals. They look at the fields that bring forth their food. They look at the water that they drink, and they see the beneficence, the goodwill of God in all of these things, and they conclude that God is good. Do they conclude correctly? Are they right? When they make him 14,000 gods, are they right? Are they saved because they're right about God's beneficence and goodwill? Not at all. Here you have simply Job's fall from one who was totally reliant upon God now to one who's trying to find the answer in himself and in doing that darkening the counsel and speaking without knowledge now let's get back to the question there and I'll bring this one back up in a minute and we'll look at Job and we'll look at God's final conclusion about Job but he begins a questionnaire and in verses 1 to 18 he asked Job some questions that are in relationship to the earth. We don't have time to study any of these, all right? And they weren't written for our study. You know, a lot of times I think we students of the Bible, teachers and preachers, sometimes spend too much time studying and not enough time just reading. The Bible was written to be read. Job has said, or God says to Job in verse 3, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. He said, okay, Job, you want to argue? We will argue. But first of all, I have the right to ask you some questions. You know, in nearly every debate, each participant hands the other one a list of written questions. And that person will answer those questions in writing, and they'll be presented during the debate. And that's one of the main features of the debate, is the answer to those written questions. So here's God's pre-debate questions. Oh, uh, where were you? When I laid the foundations of the earth, declare, answer. I demand you answer, declare. You wanted to argue, I saw your written proposition, I saw your signature, now here's mine. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Did you determine how big it will be? Have you ever measured how large it is? Did you lay the foundations of it? Did you lay the cornerstone of it? Did you listen to the first song the morning stars sang? Did you hear all of the angels shout for joy when I brought this world into creation? Excuse me, Job, I didn't hear your reply. Then he asked him questions about the oceans. He said, did you shut up the sea with its doors when it broke forth as it issued out of the womb? When I made clouds its garment and I put thick darkness as a diaper upon it and marked out its bounds and said to the sea, Hitherto shall you come, but no further, and here shall your proud wave be stayed. Did you lay a hand down that said the sea can't go beyond that? Then he asked him questions about the morning. He says, Have you commanded it to be morning since you've been born? Do you cause the day spring to come out in its time? Do you lay hold of the ends of the earth that the wicked be shaken out of it? If it be changed as clay under the seal and all things stand forth as a garment, from the wicked do you withhold their light? And, is your, and do you break off the high arm? Do you understand about the lights? Do you know where I keep things? Have you entered into the hidden places? Have you entered into the springs of the sea? Have you walked on the ocean floor? Do you know where I keep the snow? Do you know where I keep the lightning? Now, Job, if you can answer just a few of those questions, then maybe you've got a right to question me. Anybody want to answer those? 
Then he turns the relationship to the heavens in verses 19 to 38. He said, you make it light when you want it light and dark when you want it dark. Uh, beginning in about verse 22 and, and going from there, he talks about the elements of the world, the rain, the clouds, the, the tornadoes, the storms. Do you cause those? In 31 and 32, he asks, is he able to number the stars and the planets? Does he call for Orion? And does he call for the Pleiades to come out? Does he say, I want the Big Dipper right here every night? Job, you able to do that? Are you able to, are you able to make the Southern Cross be the guide for many a person that has sailed Africa's shores? Are you able to do that? Then he asked him about the laws of nature in chapter 38, verses 33 through 38. He asked him, is he able to, to uh, with his voice, make things happen on the earth where the, the, the crops, couldn't get the word out of my mouth, where the crops can grow where there were only clods? He said, are you able to do that? Are you able to make the clods into good soil and bring forth, bring forth great, great crops? The first person that topped these hills, <laughs> that got on top of the cap rock, no hills, got on top of the cap rock and looked at the staked plains. You reckon that he visioned all of the cotton that grows here today? Not unless he already knew of the underground rivers. But did God? Was God able to make the desert bloom? Every time I drive down off of that little hill into Phoenix or into Albuquerque where they've watered the desert, I'm amazed. Not at the ingenuity of man, but at the supply of God where man thought there was no supply. What's, what's God trying to teach Job? Natural history? Is this a natural history course? Is God trying to teach, teach him horticulture or agronomy or agriculture? Is this God's interest? What's God trying to do? He's trying to say, Job, if I know what's in the hidden places and I can make the desert bloom, then I can make a leper whole. And I can make an empty life full. Then he turns to what really I understand more than the other things, and that's human living things, not human things. He asked Job some questions about living things things, particularly in chapter 38, starting verse 39, going through chapter 39, verse 30. He says, look, Job, I control the beast and the birds of prey. I not only control them, I control the beast they prey upon. He says, I make beasts and birds that are beautiful, that have, that, that have no, no function except to be beautiful. He said, I created some things for no other reason than just to make things prettier because they're here. Maybe that's why he created you. I started to say me, but you would have laughed. Since I said you, y'all all feel good. You know, maybe that's why he created you, just so the world be more beautiful. You know what it is? At least that's why he recreated you, right? So that the world would be a more beautiful place for our having been here. He said, I created some birds and animals like the peacock. You know, why do you create a peacock? Has absolutely no function or purpose except to be pretty. He said, that's why I created the hummingbird. There's a lot of things. Well, the hummingbird pollinates things. But he said, I created some things with no seen purpose except to beautify things. He said, I created, that's the three things he created in living beings. And then in relationship to special cases, I started to add Job here, but I want him to be the conclusion to my lesson tonight. He says, Job, I even have control of things that the world has already counted uncontrollable. Why do we put some people in prison for life and some people in prison for 90 days? Well, we know some people you can control, right? And some people, by virtue of long practice of evil, have declared themselves to be uncontrollables. We call them incorrigibles, don't we? And when we found them to be incorrigible, we put them in a cell for life. That's taking their life any way you want to look at it. That's capital punishment. And Paul admits there are some things worthy of death, doesn't he? He says before a Jewish, uh, well, it wasn't really a Jewish, it was a Roman governor. He said, if I've done that which is worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But since I've not done that, I appeal to Caesar. So he recognizes that there are some things and some people that are incorrigible and ought to die. There are people like that, and God says, I control them in chapter 40, verses 10 to 14. He says, I'm talking about the proud, exalting evil ones. Now, you and I do evil, don't we? And if people were to look at us without knowing of our commitment to Christ, 
and see only the evil deed that we just did, they might say we are evil ones, but we're not. We are not evil ones. We're sinners, but we're not sinners by practice nor by consumption. It is not our, it is not our consuming desire to be sinners. There are people that that's true of, though. They are the proud, exalting, evil ones. God says, I'm going to control them. And then there's Behemoth and Leviathan. Anybody know who that is? Well, the King James translates Behemoth the hippopotamus. <laughs> I would look too, brother, if I were you. <laughs> uh, it's right down to the Behemoth and Leviathan. Now, the King James translates, that's the first time I've ever had to point that out to him. I'm going to have to use those words again. That makes me feel smart. Behemoth and Leviathan. Behemoth is translated in King James the hippopotamus, and Leviathan is translated in King James the crocodile. I won't argue with hippopotamus too much. It sort of fits the description. The guy has brass type eight legs and huge chest, and he goes down deep in the water, and he's slow on land and quick in water, and that sounds like hippopotamus. Don't think those dudes are slow underwater. Don't get in the part of the lake they're in. I don't remember his name, maybe Abe does, but a brother's over in Africa went swimming in a lake. Two of his, two of his sons went to school here temporarily. Or, anyway, he was swimming. He was a scuba diver. And they told him to stay on the south side of the lake. That's where the hippopotamus, hippopotami are. And he got down there and he forgot where he was. He got in the south side of the lake. All of a sudden, bam, something hit him. Knocked him out. Knocked the scuba gear off of him. He got up and here came this hippopotamus after him again. By the providence of God and a good, good ability to swim, he got away, you know, from the hippopotamus. But he found out those big old dudes are fast underwater. And so God says, look, uh, those, that's one of my pets. I mean, literally, that's what God said. Read it. He said, that's one of my pets. He does my bidding. He's one of my little puppy dogs or cats. But now the crocodile or the Leviathan is not the crocodile because this dude lives in the sea. Now when he goes... Behemoth lives in the lake and the river. But this dude lives in the sea. And when he goes through the sea, mountains of water come up behind him. It's the sea monster. Somebody knows such thing. Yes, there is. Or at least they thought there was. At least God thought there was. This is God speaking now, not Job. Don't question this. God says, I control. Somebody says, that's the whale. Read it. It's not the whale. I mean, this dude is mean. He's big. He causes mountains of water to come up behind him. He lives down in the depth of the ocean. So God controls the hippopotamus and the sea monster, whoever that is. And he says, Job, when you can do that, we will argue. Now, what's he trying to teach Job? Natural history? He's trying to teach you about hippopotami and sea monsters? Is, is that what he's trying to teach Job? Or is he trying to teach Job, son, relax. I control the uncontrollable. If you want a good study on that, start in Mark, oh, about two or three, and read about eight chapters. And Jesus controls everything that they thought was uncontrollable. Disease, disorder, decay, and death. I mean, he controlled every single thing that the world thought was uncontrollable. The world thought that all of these things on this chart were uncontrollable. And God says, I am in control. These things are my servants. Not just I created these things and they're out of control. Listen, listen. Nothing is out of control. Nothing. God is in control. Now from our viewpoint and our vantage point, with our limited knowledge, we have a lot more knowledge than Job did, but our knowledge is still limited. With our limited knowledge, some things seem to be out of control. If you believe they're out of control, as far as you could, are concerned, they are out of control. But if you know that God is behind all this, keeping watch over all of his own, and that all things are being worked by him for our eternal good, then you're able to withstand whatever occurs. Now, Job will end this book knowing that. He'll end it knowing that. So he learns a lot, doesn't he, while he's in the furnace of affliction. Now, I want to draw, because I think God does, three conclusions to that questionnaire. Now, 
<coughs> if you read to some 40 questions that Job has asked, my man in his 20th century modern, modern knowledge and, and technology has discovered the answer to one or two of them. That's how long the mountain goats breed. And uh, one other, I forget which it is. But, but man has, in his investigative search, in the last four or 5,000 years, discovered two answers to the questions that God asked Job. And so two out of 40 is still failing, isn't it? So man is still in kindergarten. And so with that questionnaire in mind, who is he that dares place himself before God and speak of judging God? Who is that one? Now Job has been that one, but this questionnaire is asked so that he'll quit being that one. God would also have us draw this conclusion. God alone is ultimate, not piety, not righteousness. Neither one of those are ultimate. Your piety, my piety. Your righteousness, my righteousness is not ultimate. God alone is ultimate. In the third place, God would have me to know everything under heaven belongs to him. Since that's true, what can you do with what belongs to you? Whatever you want to do. And if everything under heaven belongs to God, what can God do? Anything God pleases. Aren't you glad he's a good God? Aren't you glad he's a merciful God? Aren't you glad he's an orderly God? Or you'd wake up tomorrow wondering where your hand was. You know, it might be on your forehead. You ever try to eat with your hand on your forehead? That'd be a difficult thing. But because God is an orderly God, your hand's going to be right where it belongs, right where it's always been. But if God wanted to do otherwise, could he? Yeah, I'm glad he doesn't, but he could. And the fourth conclusion is God doesn't have to give an account. That's the main thing God's telling Job. Job, I'm not obligated to tell you why I'm doing what I'm doing. That literally is none of your business. And here lies the real secret to the solution of our problems. We got to finally get to the opinion that it's none of our business why God is doing what he's doing. Because that's the answer he gives the best man he had. None of your business, Job. You don't need to know why, you just need to know who. You see, if I know who, why is quit mattering? If I know that it is a loving, caring, merciful God that is controlling everything on earth and he loves me more than he loves his only begotten son or as much as he does, excuse me, I said that wrong, as much as he loves his only begotten son and more than he loves his son being present with him, then I don't believe that I can do anything but say, Lord, your will be done. After the first trial, I say trial. After the first set of questions, God asks this question or makes this challenge in chapter 40, verse 1 and 2. Moreover, Jehovah answered Job and said, Shall he that cavileth, I looked that word up and it means to argue stupidly. Shall he that argues stupidly contend with the Almighty? He that argueth with God, let him answer it. He said, Okay, Job, here's 39 questions. Uh, start. Answer those. Now, Job's too smart to do that. Job has learned a part of a lesson. Does Jesus always heal instantly and completely, or does he also sometimes heal in stages? He sometimes heals in stages, doesn't he? You remember the guy couldn't see, and Jesus touched him, and he could see men, but he saw them dimly, like walking trees. And then Jesus touched him again. He was healed totally. Now, why did he do it that way? I guess because he wanted to. But maybe also to tell me that sometimes he doesn't get it all done with the first touch. And there's a reason for that. I may not know the reason. I don't know the reason why he healed that guy in two stages. There was some reason. But sometimes that's how he does. And God has a big problem in healing Job of all of the things Job has said and all of the desires that Job has had. So he, first of all, gives him this questionnaire, and when he gets through, here's Job's reply, 40, verse 3 to 5. I love it, and I love him. Then Job answered Jehovah and said, Who, behold, I am of small account. He's better off now, isn't he? Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer thee? I lay my hand upon thy mouth. 
He said, I lay my hand upon my mouth. I said, I receive the seal. You know, that's why you, sometimes you may talk anyway. Like, you know, habit may cause you to talk. When you know you ought not to talk, put your hand you know, even then when you try to say something, nobody knows what you're saying. He says, I put my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, I will not answer. Yea, twice I have spoken, but I will proceed no further. The once and yea, twice means I've been, all, I've been doing all this talking, but I'm shutting up now. You know, I, I, I try to remember something that I read one time because it's absolutely true. You never learn talking. You never learn talking. You only learn when finally you're through talking and you shut up and start listening. And that Job is, God has finally got Job's attention and he shut up and he's going to listen to God. Isn't that good? Yeah, but it's not good enough. That's good. That is a step in the right direction. But Job has questioned God's righteousness. And so God has to speak again. And as God speaks in this second trial, he says in chapter, second trial, second test. He says in chapter 40, beginning with verse 6, <clears throat> 7, Gird up now thy loins like a man, I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Here's the crux and the key pivotal passage of the book, 40 verse 8. Will thou even annul my judgment? Will thou condemn me that thou mayest be justified? You see, after this, after the questionnaire, after that first questionnaire, what did God think of Job? What was the Lord's estimate of Job? First of all, none like him, perfect, upright, fears God, turns away from evil, holds fast his integrity under trial, great man. What was his statement of him when he first speaks? The man darkeneth counsel and speaks without knowledge. After the questionnaire and Job's going to remain silent, what does God convict him of? Of being proud. And what does that go before? Destruction. He says we'll, he, would have made, he would make God wrong so he would be right. Now, I've never done that openly, but I've done that. I've twisted the word of God for an argument's sake. Have you ever done that? See, that's what Job is doing. Job's going to be right. His whole life is built on him being right. I've got a lot of brothers and sisters like that, and bless their heart, that's why their life goes up and down like the biggest roller coaster in all the world. My identity is not based on my being right. I was talking to a brother here Tuesday night after the lesson, and he was saying, well, don't we have to be right? I said, no. Well, he looked at me like I had said Jesus was shot or hung rather than crucified, as if I'd attacked the deity of God or the inspiration of Scripture. No, I just have to be righteous. And I'm righteous by Jesus' blood. I don't have to be right. You're wrong, you know that? I'm wrong about some things. I don't know what they are. You don't know what the ones you are wrong about. If they were, we'd, if we knew, we'd be right, wouldn't we, about those things. Everybody's wrong about different things to varying degrees. And so any time that we try to make our life based on our righteousness our knowledge, our wisdom, our anything, then we're proud. And if we don't watch out, we will even make God wrong and we'll make specious interpretation of Scripture in order to remain that right person and hold that right doctrine. So Job's, God's concept of Job, at the end of the first questionnaire, is Job, you're hanging on to your pride. So his silence is not so much only the silence of I will not speak as I have once spoken, but it's also the silence that refuses to say, I repent in dust and ashes. And so God gives him another trial, and in that trial, as we've already read in chapter 40, uh, 40, <coughs> 41, chapter 40 and 41, he says, you test it out on Behemoth and Leviathan. You try to control them. Now, I don't know what it was in that last argument that was the final straw that broke Job's back. You know, it's not the straw that breaks a camel's back, though, is it? That last straw, what is it? It's the accumulated weight, isn't it? It's not the final straw that breaks his back. It's the accumulated weight of all the straws. 
And so finally, all of God's argument and all of God's discussion with Job about the natural things and about human beings and about Behemoth and Leviathan, about God's ability to bring judgment, he even challenges Job. He said, Job, you put on a beautiful robe and you deck yourself in righteousness and I'll let you judge the world for a while and see how good you do. And maybe it was that that caused Job to say in chapter 42, Job answered chapter 42, Job answered Jehovah and said, I know that thou canst do all things and that no purpose of thine can be with, with, uh, restrained. Who is this that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered things I understood not, things too wonderful for me. Like, here I beseech thee and I will speak, or let me speak and you answer me. Only way I can explain that is I'd only heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Therefore I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and in ashes. In those six verses, you've got Job's confession. And as always, I wish we had hours to discuss this, this section. There are six point, five points that I really need in my life. Number one, he acknowledges God's wise power. Has he, had he acknowledged, acknowledged God's power over and over again in the book? Yeah, he said God was using it arbitrarily. God was using it unrighteously and afflicting him. And now something in God's argument, I don't know what it was, but something in God's argument has caused Job to see God's wisdom. And so he says, now I know that no purpose of thine can be, can be restrained. And so he acknowledges his wise power. He confesses his own folly. He said, I've said things I shouldn't have said. Things way too wonderful for me. I challenge you to a debate. I recognize that now as a stupid thing. He rejoices in his deeper knowledge of God. He said, I had heard of you only with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. And he humbles himself in dust and ashes. He said, I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. And now he's ready to be restored. And I should have added, and blessed. Twice blessed. So many times we want the blessing without the acknowledgement of God's purpose, the confession of our folly, the search for a deeper knowledge of God, and the abhorring of ourselves in dust and ashes. Blessed are who, for they shall receive, or for there shall be the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, first parentheses of the Beatitudes, and blessed are the persecuted, the last parentheses of the Beatitudes. Two people possess the rule on the earth, or excuse me, the people with two, two attitudes of life and two, two nature, two, two uh, component parts of their nature control all of the kingdom of God, those that are poor in spirit and persecuted. Now, we don't see it that way. We think the A-type personality that's out front hollering loud and got his ducks all in a row and, and never is persecuted is the person that is, to be, is blessed and the person that rules the kingdom of God. No one rules the kingdom of God until they get to chapter 42, 1 to 6 of Job. They've got to acknowledge God's control, their own folly, the fact that uh, they must have a good knowledge of God and they must hate themselves in dust and ashes and then they're ready to be blessed by God. And so what's God's final estimate of Job? We're talking about Job and his God. What was his first one? Perfect and upright man. One that fears God and turns away from evil, holds their own his integrity under trial. What was his second one? This guy's darkening counsel with words without knowledge. What's his third one? This is a proud guy that would even make me right, me wrong, that he might stay right. But what's God's estimate of him now? Look at verse 7 and 8 of chapter 42. And it was so that after Jehovah had spoken these words unto Job, Jehovah said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as Job has. And what Job said about God? He was wise in his counsel. Now, he doesn't say that till after all the argument, and the friends are right there in that cave listening to all that God says to Job, and they've not yet made the response that Job made. You know why? They've had no ash heap experience. The thing that enabled Job to make this confession that caused God to be able to say, now he says right things about me. How were his words at the start of this questionnaire? Without knowledge. How are his words now at the end of this questionnaire? They're right. And then he's twice blessed. 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 
thousand she asses, seven sons, three daughters, all of his friends and acquaintances come and give him a piece of money, and everyone gives him a ring of gold. He has daughters fairer than anybody's in all the land, and he names those daughters uh, Little Dove and Flower and Beautifier. And he lives 140 years after his trials, and he sees his sons and his sons' sons, four generations, sons, grandsons, great-grandsons, great-great-grandsons. So Job died, being old and full of days. I'd like to talk to Job. I will, I guess, when I get to heaven. I really think I'm going to. I want, I want to ask him one single question. Job, what do you count the greatest experience of your life? And I'm sure he'll say it was that day on the ash heap when out of the whirlwind God spoke to me. I sought to hear the voice of God. I climbed the topmost steeple. And there God said to me, Go down. I dwell among the people. Tomorrow night, practical lessons from adversity.